Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you to genetics. In this section, we'll be discussing recombinant DNA and its applications. And as you can see in this particular session, we'll focus on the amplification and manipulation of DNA. So before we get into the meat of this, terms like biotechnology, genetic engineering, they're getting thrown around a lot these days. And it's an exciting time when these things are infiltrating even into the general culture. But I think sometimes these concepts or terms are misunderstood. And we would certainly like to make sure that we start right at the beginning till we get into the more technical details about this. So we need to start by thinking about basic tools and techniques in molecular genetics. Molecular genetics really means dealing with the molecules, perhaps obviously, involved in genetics. Often DNA is the thing that comes to mind. So the term biotechnology, first of all, I say here it's a new revolution. But I just wanted to note that in theory, biotechnology has been going, I should say, has been being practiced by human beings for quite some time. Um, selective breeding, just as one example, when human beings started to take wolves and breed them in a selective way, the result was dogs and dogs of all different types, right? So in a sense, that's using some very rudimentary knowledge about biology to do something. It's applied biology, which is really what biotechnology is. You could say the same about agricultural crops, etc. So in that very broad sense, biotechnology has been around for a while. Usually when people say it these days, they mean biotechnology using recombinant DNA. So this is another very important concept and another important term. Recombinant DNA, we've already heard you know, a lot about recombination, the general idea of making new combinations of things. This means something, it's the idea is similar, but it's specifically different. So as you see here, this use of the term recombinant, recombinant DNA, refers to the stable joining together of DNA from different species to make what I refer to here as an unnatural new molecule. The term unnatural seems to have a negative connotation to most people, and I understand why, but I mean it in the most literal and pure sense. Unnatural means something not found in nature, right? So certainly in nature, you wouldn't find an E. coli bacterium with a human insulin gene sitting in the middle of it. But that would be an example of a bacterial genome that had a human gene in it or a mouse genome that had a human gene in it. That molecule would be a recombinant DNA molecule that we have created. And this is not really the focus of this, but you know, it makes some people a little bit nervous that we're creating these things that seem unnatural to them. And I'm not even really making fun. There are some potentially valid concerns about this. But for a, a good many years now, people have been doing it on a routine basis. And this type of recombinant DNA technology is you know, considered to be very safe. And maybe we'll see it as natural as time goes by. So. There are a lot of things you can do, obviously, and we're going to focus on some of the most fundamental and basic ones. So I say here that many procedures are routinely used with this technology, but of course it depends on what it is you want to achieve. And many tools have been discovered. Discovered is important because we didn't really invent these tools. We discovered them. What we invented is a methodology of using them to achieve our ends. So we have the tools that make the manipulation of genes feasible. Something, I mean, let's face it, nobody even really understood what DNA was 50 years ago uh, completely. So, you know, even when they discovered that, I suspect that the routine way that we manipulate genes today would have seemed pretty far into the science fiction sort of world. Um, and... I guess that's the next point, is that things are possible today that uh, really didn't seem feasible not that particularly very long ago. All right, so 
we're going to take a good amount of time and focus on a very basic and important procedure called gene cloning. Now, first of all, before we even get into it, unfortunately, sometimes terminology is used in different ways. So this is really not the same as when you hear about cloning in the sense of like many of you may know about Dolly the sheep, a sheep that's often given credit as being the first actual animal that was cloned from another animal. Uh, you hear about human cloning. Imagine if I could make another one of me and I could get a lot more done. Those are things that actually are potentially feasible, but it's not really what we mean by gene cloning. Cl cloning in the most general sense just means sort of copying. So in the case of gene cloning, what it really means is this, and it's very definite about what it means. So when you clone a gene, you're taking some gene of interest. It could, in theory, be anything from a particular organism. So as we go along through this example, I'm going to use the human insulin gene because I like it, and also it's one of the first human genes that was cloned and manipulated and all sorts of good things. So we want to get a hold, as it were, of that human insulin gene, splice it into a cloning vector, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a moment. But what a cloning vector is in its most fundamental sense is a molecule from another organism, often a bacterium, that's capable of replicating in a host organism. And we're going to join those two together to make a recombinant DNA molecule. Right? In this case, it would be one that has the human insulin gene popped into a vector that's composed of genes from another organism. When you take that recombinant DNA molecule and introduce it into a compatible cell, it will then be capable of replicating itself along with that cell. And now you have a way of literally copying the gene of interest. What cloning really does, I mean, you might say that's great, but what's the point of it? There are a lot of, it's a general process. It can be used in the context of a lot of different overall procedures. But really, the way I look at it is cloning allows you to isolate a gene of interest, characterize it. Um, in other words, one thing you might want to do is sequence the DNA there. So it's sort of like I say, this may sound a little odd, but you've gotten the gene out of the big it's not really a mess, but when you approach it from our eyes, the whole human genome, it's got, you know, billions and billions of base pairs around it. We just want one little gene. So we took it out. We put it in what I call a safe place. And when it's in this safe place, you could make more of it anytime you want. You could use it for whatever you want. You have cloned the human insulin gene in this case or whatever other gene you might be interested in. So... Let us see, talk about some of the tools that are necessary for doing this. And we need tools, obviously, but in this case, there are a lot of tools, as I said before, that we've discovered. We have to manipulate them properly, but we get them to do a lot of their work for us. And one of the most important tools that was one of the first discovered that allowed this whole revolution to continue, they're called restriction enzymes. Now, officially, they're called restriction endonucleases because what they do is they cut DNA in a very specific way in the middle. That's what an endonuclease means, I mean, as opposed from chopping it from the end. They cut or cleave DNA at very specific sequences, which is great for us because, as you're going to see, we need this ability. You'll sometimes see a restriction enzymes ref enzyme referred to as molecular scissors. I read a newspaper article and it said scientists use their molecular scissors to cut out a gene from one place and put it into another place. So obviously they're not really a scissors. Uh, it's too small, and but the idea is sort of similar. So what are restriction enzymes? Where the heck do they come from? They are naturally occurring, so that's why I say we discovered them. They're usually found naturally in bacteria and Right now, hundreds, if not thousands, are commercially available. So uh, you can open up a catalog from whatever your favorite biotechnology store is and say, yeah, I'd like to get that one that cuts at this particular sequence. And that's a...